Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Top 10 Tax Strategies for 2022. Presented by PB Mayors, a top 100 CPA and business consulting firm, as noted by Accounting Today and Inside Public Accounting. My name is Sean O'Connell, and I will be facilitating and moderating. Today's webcast is being recorded, and you will receive a link to it along with the slides in our follow-up email to you after the broadcast. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. If you have any questions during today's presentation, you may enter them into your questions box on your screen. We're grateful that so many of you are, are joining us here today and will attempt to answer as many as we can during the webinar. And we've set aside some Q&A time after we count down the top 10. If we don't get to your question, a member of our team will follow up with you after the webcast. If you have any technical difficulties during this live webcast, you can refer to the recording or reach out to our team with any specific questions that you may have. I'm excited for you to hear from our panel today, which is composed of senior members of PB Mayor's tax team. You can find their bios in the handouts section of your screen. Our countdown of the top 10 will be a bit of a tennis match initially between Ed and Nick as they go back and forth. Enter your questions. Let's start with a question for you, our audience. If you had to predict your taxable income for 2022 and 2023, would you expect them to be about the same for those two years? Or your 2023 taxable income will likely be higher next year than that of this year? Or will your 2023 taxable income likely be lower than that of 2022? Or it would be very difficult for you to predict. Perhaps you're self-employed. There's a lot of things you can't see in your crystal ball yet. And that would just be a complete guessing game. So take a minute and select the one that you think is the best fit for you. While those are tabulating, just a word about how these top 10 strategies are selected. You know, there are hundreds of tax strategies. And regardless of which of those categories you find yourself in, our top 10 can, can provide you with benefits and are chosen based on what our clients are, are best leveraging this year. So let's take a look at the answers to that question. Okay, so a little of everything, but some feel their income will be about the same, some feel it'll be higher in 2023, some lower, and about 10% feel it would be very difficult to predict between those two years at this point. Great, great, thank you. And we're gonna start with Ed Yoder and number 10. Number 10, we have year-end cash receipts and disbursements. On the next slide, uh, for cash basis taxpayers, managing year-end cash receipts and disbursements can have a major impact on taxable income. It's important to have the concept of constructive receipt uh, when discussing this. Uh, constructive receipt of income determines when a cash basis taxpayer has received income. Constructive receipt of income occurs when a party obtains income that is not yet physically received, but has been credited to the taxpayer's account and over which they have immediate control. The taxpayer is liable to pay taxes on all income that is constructive received. Uh, this concept is, uh, probably best illustrated with uh, a cash basis taxpayer um, receiving checks. A check received today that is not cashed for the year does qualify as constructive receipt of income on the day that it's received because the receiver has the ability to cash it immediately. Because of constructive receipt, a cash basis taxpayer um, needs to report income if they've received checks whether it's in the post office box or sitting on their desk, uh, held checks 
still count as income for a cash basis taxpayer. If a cash basis taxpayer feels like they've got more income than they were anticipating, the only way to really delay income is to consider delaying invoicing of customers if the revenue is greater than anticipated. So just avoid issuing invoices to your customers if you want to delay having income to report. Another thing to consider is uh, disbursements, looking at accelerating payments and prepaying expenses. Uh, for farmers, uh, it's a common practice to prepay their seed and fertilizer bill in the fall every year for their spring planting. Not only are they able to obtain a deduction earlier, but they are generally incentivized with discounts for prepaying expenses. So if you are a cash basis taxpayer and you're trying to manage your taxable income, it's getting near the end of the year, you should think about maybe accelerating some payments for supplies, being able to uh, purchase items that might be delivered later uh, that you want to utilize in your business and increase your deduction. Another consideration is to for equipment purchases. Whether you're a cash basis taxpayer or an accrual basis taxpayer, equipment purchases at the year end are a common practice. With Section 168K bonus depreciation still in effect at 100% for 2022, consider equipment purchases before the end of the year for accelerated tax deductions. Now, for accrual basis taxpayers, accrual of employee wages and bonuses can be deducted if the amounts are paid within two and a half months after the year end. So for a calendar year accrual basis taxpayer, accruing wages and bonuses that are paid before March 15th can create an additional deduction. Retirement plan and profit share accruals are also deductible if they are paid by the filing of the tax return, including extensions. So if you're a business owner with a pass-through um, business and you extend your return and you accrue retirement and accrued profit-sharing amounts, you can delay payment of, of those until the extended due date of the return, which would be September 15th. For C corporations, you could extend all the way until October 15th of the following year, which becomes a good way to, to get deductions and pay for them later. Moving on to the next slide. Number nine, we have a conversion of Roth IRAs, uh, traditional IRAs to a Roth IRA. And moving on to the slide. In 2022, for the year, uh, the S&P, the equity markets, are down approximately 20% year-to-date, and the technology-heavy NASDAQ is down as much as 30%. We have seen a slight increase in equities uh, in October and November here, but for the year, the markets are still down. And there's concern that 2023 will also uh, potentially be a down year for the markets. Given the depressed market values, this could be a good opportunity to convert traditional IRA balances to Roth accounts. If you find yourself with traditional IRA accounts from previous employers and you have uh, money in those accounts, you could look to convert them to a Roth IRA account. Contributions to a Roth IRA are not tax deductible. However, the investments are provided pre preferential tax treatment and are allowed to grow tax-free. Distributions of original contributions are allowed after a five-year holding period, and distributions in retirement uh, are non-taxable. Traditional IRA balances converted to Roth IRA accounts are taxable when they are converted. There is no limit to the amount that you're allowed to convert, but given the impact on overall taxable income, you may want to consider splitting conversions over a series of years. Perhaps take 
half of your Roth or your traditional IRA account balance and convert it over in 2022 before the end of the year, and then perhaps take the second half of it and convert it in 2023 so that you spread that tax liability over. Contribution limits for Roth IRA accounts are $6,000 per year. Let's see, I think that's on the next slide. Yeah, if we can convert, uh, turn to the next slide. Uh, contribution limits for Roth IRA accounts are $6,000 per year or $7,000 if age 50 and older. These limits uh, increase $500 for 2023. There are also income limits that uh, are in effect to limit uh, taxpayers uh, from making an, a Roth IRA contribution. So for married filing joint taxpayers, if you have uh, taxable incomes over 204,000, you're not allowed to make a Roth IRA contribution. For single taxpayers, your uh, income uh, must be below $129,000. It's possible uh, to make a non-deductible traditional IRA contribution, and in doing so, uh, look to make a backdoor Roth IRA contribution. If you have, uh, are, if you're participating in an employer retirement plan and you're over certain income limits, uh, you can still make a traditional IRA contribution. It's just not tax deductible. And then soon afterward, you can convert that traditional IRA balance over to a Roth IRA account. Making the non-deductible traditional IRA contribution provides the taxpayer with basis equal to their contribution. When the balance is converted to a Roth, there is no taxable income. And in this way, high income earners are able to make annual contributions to a Roth account even if their incomes are over the limits. We've heard from Congress that they're looking to close this loophole, but nothing has transpired and the backdoor Roth IRA contribution uh, is still in effect. We should also make one other point uh, about inherited IRAs. Uh, before the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, inherited IRAs were able to be spread over the lifetime of the beneficiary who inherited the IRA. But with the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, so after beginning in 2018, inherited IRAs now must be um, fully distributed, withdrawn within 10 years of receiving the inherited IRA. So that's something to keep in mind. And with that, we're moving to number eight and Nick. Thanks, Ed, and good afternoon. Our number eight strategy centers around depreciating property. Now, when you purchase property that is used in your business, you often have some flexibility in regards to how fast you depreciate that cost. And depending on the type of property, that could range from expensing immediately in the year of purchase to depreciating over uh, up to 39 years, depending on, this all centers around the type of asset you place in service. In recent years, taxpayers have had several options if they wanted to immediately expense the cost of their purchases through either 100% bonus depreciation or Section 179 expense. Now, while both of these options accomplish the same end result, there are some nuances and they are not available in all situations. So let's discuss some of the major differences between these two options. Now first, bonus depreciation permits the deduction of a percentage of the cost of the property, while Section 179 permits the expensing up to a set dollar amount. You can really kind of pick and choose more with the Section 179 option. Now for 2022, the Section 179 deduction limit is $1,080,000 that's the most you can elect to immediately expense. And once a taxpayer places in service more than $2.7 million of property, you start to phase out of the ability to utilize Section 179. So the, the limits are pretty high there. Next, it's important to note that Section 179 expensing 
can only be taken on a trader business. So it won't apply to every real estate situation we run into. When Section 179 can be used, it is applied to each asset individually. For instance, if you bought 30 computers, you may choose to expense only five of those machines using Section 179 expensing. Whereas with bonus depreciation, you don't get that flexibility. You take bonus on all eligible property in an asset life class, or you can elect to take none for all assets in that life class. Another important nuance is that the immediate benefit of Section 179 expensing is limited to profitable businesses. Bonus depreciation does not have that restriction. It can be taken even if your business was operating at a loss in a given year. So we really analyze the taxpayer situation and depending on these different nuances, uh, try to maximize the depreciation we can take between bonus or section 179. Now moving forward, some changes coming down the line for bonus depreciation. So we've had 100% bonus depreciation, meaning you write off the entire cost of the property. But beginning in 2023, that will shift from 100% to 80%, and the rate will continue to decline 20% annually through 2026. Um, in next slide, we have a, a representation of that. Um, who will be impacted by this phase down on the bonus the most? Well, that's primarily going to be the taxpayers in situations where Section 179 is just not available and they really are only option to immediately expenses bonus. So that could be situations where there is insufficient taxable income to use the Section 179 deduction. Could be taxpayers placing substantial amounts of property in the service that exceed the placed in service limits. Those are high, once again, at $2.7 million per year. It could also be taxpayers incurring land preparation costs, such as grading or putting in a parking lot. Section 179 is not available for land improvements. For non-corporate non taxpayers, certain types of leased property are ineligible for Section 179, and they have to rely on bonus depreciation as well. So as those rates drop from 100 uh, down to 20 percent and ultimately going away uh, without another law change, that will have an impact on the decision making. Um, when we talk about automobiles, there are separate limitations that apply. And a matter of fact, actually the weight of your vehicle is a, a main driving factor there. Uh, vehicles with a gross vehicle weight rating of 6,000 pound, 6, pounds or less are deemed to be luxury automobiles and subject to additional restrictions. And that luxury automobile may be a, a, a misconception or a misnomer really anything below the 6,000 pounds falls into that class. And they are capped at, for 2022, $19,200. Now, cost segregation studies are another option that can be a powerful strategy to maximize depreciation. These are where a professional comes in and analyzes, typically it's a where you uh, either purchase a building or build a building or do major rehab to it. And it pulls apart the individual components of that building, which may be eligible for this immediate expensing, those shorter lived assets. Now these studies typically result in large depreciation deductions that reduce your taxable income, oftentimes below zero in the year the study is performed and section 179 may not be eligible. So. The cost savings we've seen provided by set cost segregation studies are largely driven by the ability to immediately expense the asset cost under the 100% bonus depreciation. So this scheduled phase down will to some extent start to diminish the value uh, in these studies, but it's still in many cases a worthwhile endeavor and we can help you implement a cost segregation strategy. Now, if you're contemplating making substantial capital contributions, I carefully consider the timing of the improvements and what recovery options will be available in the year the project is completed. And we can certainly help you maximize the depreciation that may be eligible. On to number seven, Ed. With number seven, uh, we wanted to cover Section 179D Energy Improvement Cost Reductions. 
Under Section 179D, a taxpayer may deduct the cost of energy efficient commercial building property placed in service, even though the costs were otherwise would be capitalized. If the 179D deduction is allowed, the basis in that property must be reduced by the amount of the deduction. But the 179D deduction is in lieu of capitalizing those costs. It becomes a way to um, more quickly write off improvements made to commercial buildings that would otherwise need to be capitalized and depreciated over a 39 year life. Energy improvement costs may include improvements made to the commercial building's envelope, the HVAC systems and hot water systems, and lighting. On the next slide, with the Inflation Reduction Act that was, enact, uh, that was passed a few months ago, there were several changes and enhancements that were made to Section 179. D, including it increased the deduction amount to $5 per square foot from $1.88 previously. It expanded the 179D deduction to include tax exempt organizations, including schools, hospitals, churches, charitable organizations, and facilities that are owned by any level of government. Because the owners of these public and nonprofit buildings are non-taxable entities, the deduction can now be passed on to the primary designers of the properties, making the accelerated deduction transferable to engineers, architects, contractors, energy service providers, and environmental consultants. Uh, the hope is that by allowing nonprofit and government entities to transfer the 179D deduction that doesn't benefit them, that they will be able to negotiate uh, lower fees from the designers of these properties and the hopes that the, the designers will be able to take advantage of these deductions. Um, there are some challenges uh, for the primary designers if they are able to take the 179D deduction and that uh, we, we can help out those entities if they have such a situation. Uh, back to the other changes in the from the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, there were re relaxation of qualifications for retrofits, including a decrease in the energy use intensity to 25% uh, from previously it had to have a 50% uh, with retrofits, so it makes it easier to get deductions from uh, energy improvements. And previously, the 179D deduction was limited to once per the lifetime of the building. Uh, now that's been expanded to a deduction once every three years. So a commercial building may have multiple retrofits and improvements over its useful life. The, this now allows you to uh, take the deduction more frequently. Moving on to number six, charitable giving. With the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, and there was an enhancement of the standard deduction, doubling the deduction, and in 2022, a married couple could have a standard deduction of $25,900. And single filers, the deduction is $12,950. Along with the uh, expansion of the standard deduction came the SALT cap, the state and local tax cap, limiting deductions to $10,000 as an itemized deduction. And these enhancements have made it more difficult for taxpayers to receive a tax benefit from making charitable contributions. The Tax Policy Foundation noted that before the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, approximately 30% of tax filers were able to itemize their deduction, deductions on Schedule A rather than to claim the standard deduction. And since the changes uh, in the, to the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act after uh, beginning in 2018, we're seeing only about 9% of tax filers that are able to itemize their deductions. 
If you find that you are claiming the standard deduction, uh, you should consider bunching your charitable contribution activity for two or three years into one year so that you might have enough deductions to exceed the standard deduction in one tax year, but then claim the standard deduction in the subsequent years um, that, and not make any charitable contributions. There's all been so, uh, but you should keep in mind that there's an also the uh, an above the line charitable deduction of what was it was 300 and then it moved to 600 and for 2022 I believe it's 900. Uh, so there is a certain amount that all taxpayers can claim for charitable deductions. If you look to bunch your donations into one year, uh, charitable organizations uh, don't like that. They like to have a steady stream of contributions. And because of this, we've seen a, a surge in popularity for donor-advised funds. With a donor-advised fund, donors can contribute a chunk of money to a foundation that handles the donor-advised fund and receive a tax deduction when the contribution is made. And then over a series of years, the donor can direct the charitable payments out of the donor-advised fund to the charities of their choosing. You just have to keep in mind that when you make a contribution to a donor advised fund, you're turning control of the funds over to the foundation. But donor advised funds are a great way to obtain a current tax dedu deduction and by setting aside funds for future philanthropic goals. We'll move on to number five, back to Nick. Thanks, Ed. Our number five strategy is health savings accounts. Now, a health savings account allows you to set aside money on a pre-tax basis for qualified medical expenses. And by using untaxed dollars in your HSA, a health savings account, to pay for deductibles, co-payments, co-insurance, and other medical expenses, you're able to lower your overall health care costs. You're even allowed to use your HSA to cover some costs in your health insurance plan may not cover, such as dental care, orthodontia, and eyeglasses. However, you cannot use your HSA funds to pay for your monthly insurance premiums. Now, you must be covered under a high deductible plan to be eligible to make a health savings account contribution. The high deductible requirement, it used to be a bit more daunting than it is today, at least the, the requirements by the IRS. Um, for 2022, the minimum allowed deductible is $1,400 for self-only coverage and $2,800 for family coverage. However, what you're going to find out there on the market for the HSA eligible plans, a lot of them are, have deductibles that far exceed those IRS minimums as they try to make the plans more affordable. For 2022, the contribution limits are $3,650 for self-only coverage and $7,300 for family coverage. If you're age 55 or older, you can contribute an additional $1,000. Now, the contribution is tax deductible, and that deduction arrives in the form of either reduced taxable wages on your W-2 if you're an employee under an employer's policy, or you can take a deduction on your personal income tax return if you are self-employed or have a policy outside of an employer. Now, this kind of feels like it would be part of the itemized deductions, but it is not. So even if you take a standard deduction, you could still take a deduction on your individual return for a health savings account contribution. Now, when you incur medical expenses, you can choose to either pay directly through the HSA, and there's often a debit card you can carry linked to the account, or you can reimburse yourself for having paid with personal funds. There is no time requirement for how quickly you have to reimburse yourself, which allows a wonderful tax planning opportunity. Now, many savvy taxpayers choose to delay reimbursement for a significant period of time often and allow their HSA to function as a retirement plan providing tax-free growth. When those funds are needed in retirement, you can access them tax-free as long as you have medical receipts to cover the distribution. You do not need to be currently covered under a health savings plan to use the built-up funds in the HSA account. 
if you are planning on saving receipts and delaying reimbursement, I would really highly suggest that you keep a digital archive of the receipts. You know, decades and sometimes upon decades of medical ex receipts can become a bit overwhelming to track and manage otherwise. And I do get a lot of questions about whether distributions are tax and or penalty free after reaching age 65. So let me summarize that. If you distribute funds from your HSA prior, prior to reaching age 65 for non-medical expenses, you will be taxed on the distribution and it is subject to a 20% penalty. Now, after you reach age 65, the 20% penalty goes away altogether, but it must be a reimbursement for a qualified medical expense for the distribution to also be tax-free. So that requirement that it's a reimbursement of medical expenses, that stays even after age 65. Now, reality is an HSA is the most powerful retirement planning tool around from some respects. Roth IRAs garner attention as being an attractive investment vehicle. And uh, the advance the slide, the Roth IRA completes what we call the double play, tax-free earnings and tax-free distributions. But only an HSA completes the triple play, upfront deduction, tax-free earnings and tax-free distributions. It really doesn't get any better than that from a tax perspective. And when you also take into account the lower premiums due to the higher deductibles, it is often the best health insurance option for those that are relatively healthy. So on to number four. A good bit of our coverage areas in Virginia. I know we go into Maryland and North Carolina and beyond, um, but we wanted to cover Virginia tax credits uh, with number four. Virginia taxpayers have the opportunity to tax advantages of several tax programs. Two of the most favored are the Land Preservation Tax Credits and the Department of Education Improvement Scholarship Program. With the Virginia Education's Improvement Scholarships Tax Program, it offers a 65% tax credit to individuals and businesses that donate to qualified scholarship foundations. The foundations then provide private school scholarships to students whose families meet the income requirements. Students must come from households where family income is less than 300% of the federal poverty line, which is $83,250 for a family of four in 2022. Students with special needs also are eligible and have an income limitation of 400% of the federal poverty line which is $111,000 for a family of four in 2022. Students must be either enrollees in a kindergarten or first grade or be a public school student the previous school year, a previous scholarship recipient, or a new resident to Virginia. So you have to be coming from outside the program uh, to take advantage. If a taxpayer would contribute $10,000 to a foundation administering the Virginia Department of Education Scholarship Tax Program, they would receive a $6,500 tax credit on their Virginia tax return. They would be also able to claim the difference, $3,500, as a charitable contribution, provided they're able to itemize their deduction. Then we have land preservation tax credits which is a program enabled by the Virginia Land Conservation Incentives Act. Through this program, Virginia allows an income tax credit for 40% of the value of donated land or conservation easements. Taxpayers may use up to $20,000 of tax credit per year. Tax credits may be carried forward for up to 10 years after the year of donation and unused credits may be sold, allowing individuals with little or no Virginia income tax burden to take advantage of the benefit by selling the credits. We typically see credits being sold around 90 cents on the dollar. If a taxpayer would purchase $20,000 of tax credits at $18,000, 90 cents on the dollar, they could save $2,000 on their tax bill simply by purchasing the credits to cover their state tax liability. 
The gain is taxable in the subsequent year, but we also find that taxpayers uh, like the ability to buy these tax credits and save on their Virginia taxes. Lastly, I would wanna talk about Virginia 529 plans, which is not a tax credit, but contributions to a Virginia 529 plan are deductible and reduce Virginia taxable income up to $4,000 per account per year. So taxpayers with children or grandchildren looking for college, a 529 plan looks uh, is a good opportunity to contribute and get a tax deduction. With that, we'll move on to number three and back to Nick. Number three strategy is opportunity zone funds. Now, opportunity zones are census tracts in low-income communities designated by the governor of each state. There are over 8,700 of these separate opportunity zones located across the U.S., many of which have experienced a, a lack of investment for decades. And you'll see on the screen, uh, it looks a little speckled. Well, those are all of the various opportunity zones in the you know states we operate. There are a lot of them. Um, the Opportunity Zone funds are investment vehicles established to invest in Opportunity Zone assets and offer several tax incentives aimed at providing uh, additional returns to investors and are attractive financing opportunities for real estate projects. Investing in an Opportunity Zone fund provides three separate tax benefits, albeit one of these benefits has expired. The first benefit was deferral of the gain on the sale of a capital asset, and you can elect to take part in this up through 2026. If you defer that gain uh, prior to 2026, it will become taxable in the tax year 2026. So that's a deferral of a gain. The second benefit, which has expired, Investments made prior to 2022 were eligible for a reduction in the deferred gain if certain holding periods were met in the Opportunity Zone Fund investment. And while this benefit has expired, there is legislation floating around Congress that would revive this benefit for a few more years. There's a really a wonderful article that we have up on our blog post from back in October to discuss a host of potential changes in the proposed Opportunity Zones Transparency Extension and Improvement Act. And we're watching that closely here at year end, but it has not to date been passed. The third and overwhelmingly largest benefit and why so many people get excited by these pro this program is tax-free appreciation in the Opportunity Zone Fund if you meet a 10-year holding period. So really the sky is the limit here on the benefit, entirely tax-free gain after holding the investment for 10 years. So how does all this work? Well, if you incur a capital gain, you have 180 days to reinvest the gain portion of the funds into an opportunity zone. And we wanna be careful there, 180 days is not always exactly six months. Um, and so sometimes I've heard people use those interchangeably. It is 180 days. The 180 day measurement period can be tricky as there's several different ways and options in measuring 180 days. After receiving the investors deferred gains, that Opportunity Zone Fund subsequently invests in qualified property, which oftentimes is a separate sub-tiered operating entity referred to as the Opportunity Zone Business. Now that Opportunity Zone Fund could choose to be, you know, take in the deferred gains and be the operating entity itself and do everything within one entity, but that is typically not advisable because it's far more restrictive. But ultimately the invested capital, those deferred gains must be used to purchase property within the geographical boundaries of an Opportunity Zone. This is most often the construction or substantial rehab of real estate, but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be. And we've seen other types of property used such as uh, solar farms, putting solar panels inside of those opportunity zones. We see investors approach making an opportunity zone investment really from two different perspectives. A passive investor would typically choose to invest in a larger diversified fund 
This is operated by a professional investment manager. Now, these are highly structured plans comprised of many different projects in various opportunity zones across America. It's important to understand, if you're looking at investing in one of these, how the specific fund operates and pay special, special attention to where the investment returns go. Some of these plans that we have run into provide rather aggressive returns to the promoters and cap the investor's upside. On the other hand, someone with more real estate development experience may choose to cut out the middleman and operate their own fund. And while this avenue can provide really substantial tax savings and investment returns, the legal and tax structure of these funds and oftentimes sub-tiered opportunity zone businesses is extremely complex and you do need an expert that has you know specific knowledge in this area. And PB Mayors has studied these and worked with these over the last uh, four or five years in depth. So if you are looking at potentially making one of these investments, reach out, we can advise you on that. But either route you go, uh, an investment in an Opportunity Zone Fund can be an effective strategy in managing your capital gains tax and providing some tax-free gains down the road. Moving on to our number two strategy. This is the pass-through entity tax. And for most of our audience, this is just first coming online in 2022, and it is a big, big deal. Most of the changes enacted under the Massive Tax Cuts and Jobs Act back in 2017 were beneficial to taxpayers. But one of the biggest changes that negatively impacted taxpayers was a provision that limited an individual's deduction for state and local tax payments to $10,000 a year. And these state and local tax payments in excess of $10,000 are no longer deductible by an individual. A number of states that were disproportionately affected by this provision quickly enacted so-called workaround programs. You may have heard about California and their real estate taxes are at such a high rate, they felt like this was unfair to them. But in 2018, Connecticut was actually the first state to enact a pass-through entity level income tax, specifically as a workaround to the $10,000 state and local tax limitation. At the time, practitioners were really unsure whether the IRS was even going to approve such a workaround, as they had already nipped in the bud some other strategies that had come online, such as the charitable contribution deduction that also provides a state tax credit. The IRS viewed that as a disguised income tax payment. However, in 2020, the IRS announced this plan to propose regulations confirming the pass-through entity tax deduction would not be subject to a $10,000 state and local tax cap, which provided high-level assurance for the states to move forward with their own programs. This IRS notice has resulted in really the majority of states with income taxes enacting some type of income-based workaround program. And to date, there's about 30 plus states that have a program either has already gone into effect or will in 2022. So how does this concept work? Well, with pass-through entities, the taxable income is reported at the entity level, but it is ultimately taxed at the individual level. If an entity chooses to elect into the pass-through entity tax, the state tax burden of the income is calculated and paid by the entity and deducted for federal purposes at the entity level without any limitation. The entity passes the taxable income, which is net of that state tax deduction, down to the owner to be taxed at the individual level, along with a state tax credit, thereby completely circumventing this $10,000 state and local tax limitation. And additionally, a state tax credit is often allowed if an individual's, in an individual's home state for pass-through entity tax payments made to some non-resident states, maybe have a multi-state business. It does not hinder this opportunity. Moving forward, we anticipate the overwhelming majority of pass-through entities that are eligible would choose to elect into the new pass-through entity tax, as these savings can be substantial. Entities electing into the pass-through entity tax will be required to make quarterly estimated tax payments at the entity level moving forward. So what is happening around our footprint? Well, in Maryland, 
uh, they enacted this pass-through entity tax in 2020. So that program has already been up and running for a few years, and uh, we believe that's pretty much what North Carolina and Virginia uh, really watched closely when it put its regulations together. In Maryland, eligible entities include S corporations, partnerships, and business or statutory trusts. Um, and next slide. Um, in Virginia, this will be available in 2022 for the first time, and it's actually going to be retroactively uh, eligible for 2021, though the regulations on the how-to for that retroactive 2021 opportunity, those are still forthcoming. The draft guidelines for 2022 were issued at the end of October or a few weeks ago. In Virginia, an eligible entity is a pass-through entity 100% owned by natural persons. So in the case of a multi-tiered partnership, the lower tiered entity cannot make the election. So that may cause some problems for certain entities. In North Carolina, this will be available starting in 2022 as well. Eligible entities include all S corporations and partnerships owned by individuals, estates, and certain trusts and tax exempt organizations. Uh, the District of Columbia has not yet proposed or enacted a pass-through entity tax. So some planning considerations here. Now, since the pass-through entity tax is only available to pass-through entities, taxpayers doing business outside of an entity structure, uh, for instance, a single member LLC or a sole proprietor, they are left out of this opportunity. So consider adding, um, for instance, a spouse to file as a partnership if a single member LLC or even electing to be an S corporation where that may make sense. The timing of the payment is important as well, especially for cash basis taxpayers. So for 2022, if you're a cash basis taxpayer and you wanna get that deduction into the 2022 tax year and not wait to deduct it till 2023, you're gonna to have to make an estimate and a payment in December here before the end of the year uh, you cannot pay this here in, in March when the due date of the return falls and deduct that into the 2022 tax year. That's for cash basis taxpayers. Now, another question we've gotten a lot over the last couple of months as people have heard about this is, and you can't blame people for trying here, um, is can you load up on state tax, pastor entity tax payments to cover other sources of income? Let's say you have a brokerage account that you own personally and you've done well, and you also have a pass-through entity. Can you pay more uh, tax than would be due on that entity's income? And the answer is no. It's a formulaic approach. It's your taxable income in your entity times the state's tax rate, and that's the most you can do. There are a lot of additional details. This is a new program for North Carolina and Virginia, and I suggest registering for our in-depth webinar on pass-through entity tax, and that's going to be noon on December 7th. Great, wonderful. Thanks, Nick and Ed, and uh, thanks for plugging our upcoming webinar. We have some great audience questions coming in. So thank you for sharing those. Please continue. We're going to shortly, we're going to hear reveal here our number one top strategy. I, I wanted to share one of the questions. What is the largest unused tax write-off I need to know about? Like what's the one big thing? And um, that's great. That's great. There's kind of a tax gap in the United States and it works both ways. Congress talks about the gap as, as far as what taxpayers should be paying versus what they are. But there's also a gap because taxpayers in many cases are paying much more than they're actually required to. And one of these has to do with uh, our number one top tax strategy for 2022. And for this discussion, we'd like to bring on Gary Kitts, our firm's retirement plan services leader. Thanks, Sean, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I appreciate the top billing for retirement plans and and uh, next slide please the you know, retirement plans are one of the more basic tax planning strategies um, you, you might call it an old reliable uh, 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 strategy that's been around but but I think there are many new twists to consider um, and when when you're doing your tax planning the in, in, in retirement plans are applicable to all types of sizes of businesses. You could be an owner-only business, no employees at all, or a business with many employees, 
I think for, for those that have many employees or a good number of employees, the competitive benefits piece of it and recruiting or retention might be a bit more um, higher on the scale as far as um, you know what your goals are, but and and maybe the tax planning strategy, the what's in it for me for the owner comes uh, behind that. But today we're going to focus on just the tax planning piece for the owner, the what's in it for me. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so there are four basic circumstances or questions that I think you can. If these apply to you, then there's an opportunity to improve your results by taking a look at the retirement plan vehicle that you have in place or the design. The, the first one is obvious. If you have no plan, possibly you're just using a personal IRA for your retirement savings. There's, you know, uh, yeah, there's, there's an obvious opportunity there to look at one of the, the, the various um, options you have. The second one is if you have a simple plan or a SEP, I just call them the group IRA plans, and you, you feel like you would like to do more. Um, in, in, with a simple plan, for example, the, the maximum contribution for an individual via salary deferral is $14. $15,000. There's an additional $3,000 available if you're 50 or older. And then the only employer contribution available is a matching contribution and it's limited to 3% of pay. And the SEP has its, its own um, set of restrictions and we'll get into that on, on one of the subsequent slides. The next one is if you have a 401k plan, but the 401k plan as, as your, your contributions are limited and maybe it's just not um, accomplishing all the things you would like it to do. And there's, there's, there's design things you can do to improve that and it might be worth taking a look at um, you know, how, how you can improve the results and at least be able to maximize your personal contributions and maybe take care of some additional um, things you want to do for your employees to improve uh, retention and your recruiting uh, as well. The last one is <laughs> you, you've got a 401k plan, everything's great, you're maxing out, you're taking care of your employees with, a, with competitive benefits, but you want to do more for yourself and you would like to do a lot more. Well, there's a vehicle for doing that, and we'll briefly cover it. But uh, there, there's you know, that that's not just the limit stopping there at that 401k plan. So, summarize: if you answered, "Yeah, that's me," on any of these four um, uh, circumstances, then there's probably an opportunity to make some meaningful changes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Just a reminder on the deadlines for setting up a plan, because that's changed recently. It changed with the SECURE Act back in 2020. Um, but for you know, ever before that, if you wanted to have a qualified plan other than a SEP, which, which is not technically a qualified plan, you had to have it in place prior to the end of the year that you wanted to implement it. So for 2022, you know, you, could potentially be scrambling around to set up a plan in December. That's no longer the case. You have in the, the subsequent year following the tax year you're trying to, you, you want to start the plan to get, get the plan established. I mean, from a practical standpoint, you really need to have the plan in place and have it funded before you file your tax return to get that tax deduction back in the prior year. Ed mentioned the timing of, you know, that even for cash basis taxpayers, you and deduct that um, as long as you pay it before you file your tax return. <clears throat> so even though you 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 know if you don't have a plan in place or if you want to add a, a different type of plan, procrastination doesn't necessarily pay off. It yes, you can do it later, but often there are other there there are additional levers you can pull, options you have if the earlier you put it in place, especially prior to end of year or earlier in the year, 
um, as you're doing your planning. So don't, don't delay is really the message there. Next slide. <clears throat> so what, what, what the real question I think is for a business owner is, you know, there's several, it's, you know, okay, well, what's in it for me? What can I get out of this for myself? That might not be the overriding question, but that it's important in the overall consideration. And then the second one is, well, what am I, what's it going to cost for my employees? And then, you know, you'll, you'll be deciding, does that make economic sense? And does it take care of you know, having competitive benefits as well? Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to try and to, to quickly give you and some examples to give you some ranges of ideas to get you, maybe help you narrow down what's the right solution for you if you don't have a plan now or if you have one other things that could be available. So next slide. <clears throat> so here are um, is a chart that to kind of give you a high level yeah, you know, here's how each type of plan works and what it, what's in it for me and what the cost is for my employees. And in the example, I used a an owner with, that was earning $305,000 the way that's the covered compensation limit for 2022. So that's why I use that. Doesn't mean that if your earnings are less than that, that a plan's not advantageous. It certainly is. It was just had to pick a number. So that's the number I, I chose. Um, and, and then the columns are, you know, if you're less than 50, so you're not catch up eligible, if you're 50 or older, and then the cost for the employees is split between those that are contributing and those that are not. So just to go down through the examples, of course, if you don't have a plan and you're just doing your IRA, what you're able to do for yourself is the $6,000 that we've referred to earlier and, and 7,000 if you're catch up eligible. Of course, there's no cost for your employees if you have them. With a simple plan, <clears throat> your, your maximum contribution of 305 of under 50 is 23,150. That consists of the $14,000 salary deferral plus a 3% match. And, and it's dollar for dollar on the first 3%. If you're over 50, you get the additional $3,000 in salary deferral. Um, and, and your exposure or your potential cost for your employees is limited to that 3% match. If the employees that are eligible are not contributing, there's no cost for them. For those that are contributing, if they contribute 15%, they still get a 3% match is how it works. The, the next example is just is a SEP, um, which is you know, an IRA type uh, solution as well. Um, and there, there's not any salary deferral, you know, the 401k type salary deferral feature to that. So there's not any difference between someone who's um, under 50 or 50 and older. And the maximum contribution at, at the, is $61,000 a year. Um, if you happen to have a SEP and you have eligible employees, everyone gets the same contribution as a percentage of pay. It's totally employer funded. So in eligible employers, employees in that example would get a 20% contribution. Not the most efficient um, solution for a retirement plan or vehicle if you have employees because of, of the way that works for a SEP. Moving on to the next example is a 401k plan, uh, and, and you see the limits there for salary deferral for if you catch up eligible or not. So it's either $20,500 or $27,000. And, and if, if you maxed out your salary deferrals, the maximum employer contribution would be $40,500. That could which can, could consist of a match and a discretionary profit sharing contribution or just a discretionary profit sharing contribution. But the maximum with that type of plan, um, like the SEP is 61,000, but then you get the, the, the catch up um, as part of that. So 67.5 if you're 50 or older. The part that I think is, is critical is also, well, what's the potential cost for my employees? And we've given you a range. 
it, and it really depends on the plan design, the makeup of your employees, how old they are compared to your age, how some of the non-discrimination testing works. Um, and, and, but it's going to be within that range. If it's a matching plan, the least it's going to cost is 4.43% for those that are contributing up to a maximum of 10.33. Wide range, a lot of variables going into that. So didn't really have time in, in this uh, you know, brief presentation to show you all of those options. If the employee happens to be not contributing, it can reduce the the you know the low end of that down to 3.09% um, uh, for for the cost for the employees. <clears throat> Last example is is this is the very large contribution. So if you were the person who said, yeah, my 401k is great, but I'd really like to do more. Well, this is how you do it, is you add on a pension plan to the 401k, a separate plan, but in, 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 in usually the solution is a cash balance plan, which is a type of defined benefit plan. And the examples I've given you if the, if the owner is age 45 versus age 55, and, and just walking through that step by step, you know, you get your salary deferral at, at age 45, 20,500. Typically, the employer contribution for the owner is a little, is somewhat more limited in the, the 401k plan, doesn't have to be. But for this example, I limited it to 6%. So that's the 18,300. But then the maximum contribution or the, 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 the estimated contribution each year would be about $135,000 at the top end for um, someone who was age 45 to get their annual um, savings and tax deductible savings up to $173,800. Go to age 55, a big difference. You get the catch up contribution on your 401k plus additional, um, <clears throat> a larger cash balance plan contribution. Of course, those examples are just are showing you the maximum doesn't mean to implement that type of plan you'd have to be there that's a pretty big appetite if it's somewhere in between there's also an opportunity to take advantage of that type of plan cost for the employees is a little harder to predict when you put the pension plan on top without having the specific uh, makeup of the employees and census data but generally, you, what we expect is for the cost for the employees to be somewhere between seven and a half and 10% with um, that combined solution. So anyway, keep in mind, these are you know, just high level examples to get you thinking and you know, where, what, what, what options you might wanna look at. And this is all based on the 2022 limits. Next slide, please. And just to, to um, summarize or, or, or a couple other things to point out, if you don't have a plan in place and you're setting up a, a new plan, there's some nice tax credits available for small business plans. So if you're benefiting some uh, non-highly compensated employees, if you have employees that, that are gonna be eligible, there are, are some, some nice incentives for the, and they cover the first year, the year you in, install the plan and the subsequent two years. So that, that's very helpful. The limits that I used in my examples were from the current year. The 2023 limits have been, um, uh, have been are out and, and they're significantly higher. They're based on inflation. So um, you know, the largest increases I've seen, and I've been doing this for, for, for longer than I'd like to say, but the, anyway, what that means is that, you know, the retirement plan will be even more advantageous going forward with the higher limits. Back to you, Sean. Thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thanks. We'd like to thank our panelists. We do have some great questions that have been coming in, and I've had some fun answering them in the Q&A. But there are three that have um, been asked more than one way by more than one person. And the first one's going to be for Gary and then Ed, and then, then the third one we'll throw to Nick. 
So Gary, <laughs> uh, one of our attendees is having a good year. They do have a 401k. They do have a plan in place. What is the maximum that they can match as far as a percentage of compensation? 3%, 5% more? What could they do if they chose to um, share with the team and, and the executives? There's not, I mean, if, if it's a traditional 401k plan, there's not a limit on the the uh, the amount that's matched um, it's me as far as the the deferral matched of course there's limits on the employer contribution so you know your your tax deductible contribution could be up to 25 percent of covered pay um, is is what, what the top line would be at, as a group you generally don't get to that 25 percent to accomplish what you're trying to do Okay, good. So there is that overall limit, but it is quite high. Great. Yes. Thank you. Uh, one of our attendees was asking about strategies to those who take the standard deduction, who do not itemize. And I think Ed and Nick have done a great job of hitting on some of those strategies. Ed mentioning bunching of charitable contributions and donor advised funds. Nick talking about health savings accounts. Um, but Ed, this one is someone is now taking required minimum distributions from their IRAs. And anything you want to share about the ability to um, direct that to a charity as opposed to taking the the RMD themselves and and why someone would do that. Yeah, sure. Um, so for taxpayers age 72 and older, they have to take required minimum distributions. Um, if they have enough uh, income from other sources and aren't wanting to take money out of their IRA, there is an option to make qualified charitable distributions out of the IRA up to $100,000 per year. So instead of taking the RMD out and it being taxable to the taxpayer, they could elect to or direct their RMD to be sent directly to a charity or multiple charities of their choosing. Doing so makes the qualified charitable distribution uh, not taxable to the taxpayer and of course they they don't get a charitable deduction for it either but by keeping the rmd out of their taxable income it uh, makes the taxpayer have a lower overall adjusted gross income and that may help them uh, stay below certain thresholds so we do see it as a tax strategy for seniors age 72 and older that are charitably inclined wonderful thank you uh, Nick, our, our other question deals with health savings accounts and some intrigue around the triple play, the triple benefit, and someone is building up their health savings account. They're not withdrawing from it for medical expenses. They're letting it grow. They're letting it build. They're using other assets for paying their medical expenses, and they get this large health savings account, and then they die, and they have a death beneficiary. And um, I guess I've never seen this in actual practice where someone would inherit a health savings account and what then for the next generation who gets this health savings account that could be large? What, how does that work? Yeah, and obviously that's an unfortunate situation to start with, but it really depends on who the beneficiary of that HSA account is. So, you know, pay special importance to that when you're filling out the paperwork. It could have a ramification. So if the beneficiary is the spouse, it becomes the HSA of the spouse. It, they just slip right into their shoes. I would say it's similar to the rules with IRAs at death for a spouse. However, if the owner uh, designates a non-spouse beneficiary, such as a child or, or somebody other than the spouse, really, um, it's a completely different story. That is going to be taxable income to that recipient. It ceases to be an HSA account at that point. You're not subject to the 20% penalty. Now, there's one carve out that any portion of an inherited HSA balance used to pay for the outstanding medical expenses of the deceased owner within one year of that owner's death will not be taxable to the non-spouse beneficiary. And sometimes you could also have your estate as the beneficiary. And in that case, the gross income actually shows up on the deceased final income tax return as taxable income. So 
different outcomes depending on who you name as your beneficiary. So uh, pay special attention to that as you fill out your paperwork. Great, great. And even if you don't achieve the triple play and you die with a large HSA, you're still getting the double play and the next generation is just paying ordinary income tax on it. Good. Okay, wonderful. Uh, there were several questions about the pass-through entity tax election and and um, honestly, that's that's understandable. It's new. And that's why we have on our next screen, we have a couple of webinars that are coming up that will focus more on that. There's one on November 30, which is the lease standard and accounting standard for businesses who are leasing either real estate or personal property and what they're doing with respect to uh, their financial statements. And the pass through entity tax election that Nick covered will be a one hour long webinar on December 7. We hope that you'll tune in. Several are asking about that already and we'll be sending you the link to register uh, and check out our website for more details and to register. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you found our presentation useful and informative. Don't hesitate to reach out for more information or if you'd like to move forward with developing your tax planning strategies. If you send us a question that we did not answer today uh, and we see you, we got your questions, very good ones, we will follow up with you. You'll also be receiving an email with links to today's presentation. At the conclusion of today's presentation uh, webinar, you will receive a brief three question survey and we ask that you take a few minutes to complete it. Your responses will help us to develop future webinars. Thank you again and goodbye.